All right, good morning again, everyone. Good to see you. Can I uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1? If you're new with us, we want to welcome you and let you know that we have recently started a new study here at Calvary on Sunday morning. We are studying our way through the Gospel of John, and we are currently working our way through John's introduction, which we'll finish today. Uh, His introduction covers the first 18 verses. And in these 18 verses, as we have said, John is giving us a crash course in Christology, which is a study of the person and nature of Jesus Christ. Why is John doing this? Well, again, as we pointed out, John desperately wants people to receive the life that Jesus and Jesus only can give them. 54 times in his gospel, he talks about this life. And uh, he knows that it's uh, eternal life. It's uh, the life of God manifested in us. But he also knows it's only found in Christ, the true Christ. You see, John had already in his own life experienced numerous false Christs. He knew others were coming. And uh, these were imposters. These were men who claimed to be the Christ of God, the Messiah. But they were false Christs who had led many astray. And therefore, John realizes that if he's going to present Christ for eternal life, he had better define what Christ he has in mind. And so he spends the first 18 verses of his gospel giving us an introduction into who this Christ is, a critical understanding of Christ. Uh, it's, uh, our understanding of Christ is critical if uh, we're going to receive eternal life through him. And, and so again, with that in mind, John begins, he opens his gospel by giving us seven attributes or distinguishing marks of the true Christ, so that we will not be deceived by an imposter, that we will know who the true Christ of God really is. Let me read the outline we've been working off of one last time. And uh, we have seen in these 18 verses, first of all, the eternal preexistence of Jesus Christ, beginning part of verse 1 and then verse 2. Next, we looked at the equality of Christ with God, middle of verse 1. Thirdly, the oneness of Christ with God, end of verse 1. Number four, the omnipotence of Christ, verse 3. Then we looked at the life and light of Christ, verses 4 and 5, and then 9 through 13. Last week, we looked at the herald of Christ, verses 6 through 8, John the Baptist. And that then, guys, brings us to the seventh and final point in our outline on John's crash course in Christology, the incarnation of Christ. Now, I want to read the beginning part of verse 14, but before I do, I want to back up to verse 1, where John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh. Now, this statement, the word became flesh, becomes the climax of John's introduction to the true Christ. The true Christ is unique among all the other false Christs or any man uh, that that had ever come before the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, They were all mere men. But the true Christ was and is the God-man. He is fully God and fully man, not just 50% God and 50% man. He is fully God and fully man, what the, what the theologians refer to as the hypostatic union. Now, this is where eternity intersects with time. In the beginning was the Word, eternity passed, and then the Word became flesh. We see eternity intersect with time. This is where the infinite becomes finite where the invisible God becomes finite man. In these four words, guys, the word became flesh. You not only have the most profound truth in the Bible, and for that matter, in the history of mankind, but you also have the core doctrine that separates Christianity from every other faith system on the planet, really. For only Christianity teaches the incarnation where the eternal God stepped into time and became a flesh and blood human being, a descendant of Adam, and our kinsman redeemer. Now, let's stop for a minute and go back to the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which says, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 3 then says, then God said. So in the first few verses of the Bible, we learn that there is a God, an all-powerful, all-knowing being, and that he created everything in the physical universe. He created all things. And not only that, but he speaks. Later, we learn that he desires to communicate with those made in his image, those he had made in his image or mankind. Now, theologians tell us that God speaks to us in two primary ways. First, through the creation, which they refer to as general revelation. I won't have you turn to these. I'll just read them. Two very famous verses on this subject. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3. The psalmist said, The heavens, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. And so the psalmist is saying the creation speaks a universal language of the existence of God. That he is powerful. He is awesome. The the universe is is gigantic, right? Uh, The Bible says God measures the universe with the span of his hand from his tip of his little finger to thumb, allegorically speaking, okay? But he's that big. So the creation speaks a universal language of God's existence. But then Paul becomes specific in Romans 1.20 when he said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes or qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made so that men are without excuse. The creation is such a powerful revelation of God's existence. That anyone who looks into the creation and still denies that God exists, God will hold them accountable on the day of judgment. But listen, as powerful a source of communication the creation is for proclaiming the existence of God, it doesn't provide us with any specific information about him. And that is why God chose to provide us with an, an additional form of communication that we might know him personally. It's the scriptures or what the theologians call special revelation. Special revelation. Through the scriptures, you might say God kind of gets up close and personal with us, giving us you know, specific, specific information about who he is, what he desires from our lives. You know, he even tells us his name. God is introducing himself through the uh, scriptures. The scriptures are, once again, God's special revelation to mankind. And that's important because Judeo-Christianity claims to be a revealed truth. A revealed truth. Now, a revelation is something that is made known to us by God. It's information, guys, that would be impossible for us to know through any personal study or investigation or searching on our part. In fact, Job, many centuries ago, asked the rhetorical question, can a man by searching find God? And, of course, the answer to that question is no. No. Why? Why? The reason is because God, the Bible says God is spirit, who lives in the spirit realm, but man is a physical being who lives in the physical realm. And because man is physical and God is spirit, there is no way for a physical human being being trapped in a box we call our four-dimensional universe, height, width, depth, and time, although the uh, super string theorists say there's at least ten dimensions in the physical universe. Let's just keep it simple, all right? There is no way a human being trapped in a four-dimensional physical universe can, through the use of any technique, I don't care if it's um, visualization, transcendental meditation, assuming the lotus position, staring at your navel and going, um, (laughs) nothing you do will allow you to poke a hole in the box, climb out and find God. Now, a lot of folks believe they've done that very thing, through the use of transcendental meditation or astral projection or something, they believe they have poked a hole in the box, climbed out into the spirit realm, and have interacted with spirits on the astral plane and all of that. Let me just say this to you. It's deception. Flat out, plain and simple, it's deception. The devil wants you to think you can use techniques to transcend the physical universe and to find, you know, spirit beings and have contact with them to gain wisdom and and, and understanding of secret things. 
That's what the occult means, secret things. Not so secret anymore. Our, the occult has become mainstream in our culture today. But the idea is it's all deception. It's all an illusion. The devil is trying to get people away from the truth by feeding them lies, lies that they can find spiritual truth apart from what the Bible says and so on. But you see, the plain, simple reality is no matter how sincere a person is or, or how hard they try, they are incapable. Listen, they are incapable of reaching beyond the boundaries of the physical, natural realm in which they are trapped. And as such, they are incapable of knowing anything or understanding anything about the spirit realm, and especially God who is spirit, who is supernatural and transcends the natural. Well, there's no way a natural being can transcend that environment to come in contact with or interact with the spirit realm, and in particular, God. I like what one author said in this. He said, and I quote, We can't expect the bug in the bottle to understand the little boy that put it there any more than we can expect the natural man with his natural capacities to understand the supernatural God unless that God chose to condescend to reveal himself to man, end quote. And guys, that's, of course, what God did. That's what special revelation is all about. It's essentially where the supernatural God has condescended and invaded our realm, the, the, the physical realm, to give us a message, to speak to us truth that we could not know because we can't interact with the spirit realm. So God, as spirit, transcended that, came down, and uh, he uh, invaded the box, our four-dimensional universe, to communicate to us by revealing who he is, uh, what his will is for our lives, again, we call it special revelation. Now, some of the ways God has revealed divine truth to us in the past would include, you know, speaking through prophets, angels, or through dreams and visions. But by far the greatest revelation, the greatest revelation that God ever gave was the incarnation. The incarnation. And that's exactly what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. He said, God, who at different times and in various ways, listen, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. You see, for many centuries, God revealed himself to man in what we might call bits and pieces of information, what the theologians call the progressive revelation of God. And the point that the writer to the Hebrews is making is that God did speak through, you know, the Jewish prophets to the fathers. They would be the Jewish patriarchs and leaders of Israel. And God did speak to them. But the revelation he gave them of himself, although true, listen, was still incomplete. Was still incomplete. However, the greatest and most complete revelation God ever gave to mankind of himself was through the incarnation. Again, verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that's an interesting Greek word that John chooses for dwelt. Not the normal word that we, he could have used for, you know, joined us, hung out with us for a while kind of thing. He uses a Greek word, tab, uh, he, it says dwelt. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek is actually tabernacled. We could translate it this way. The word became flesh and tabernacled, or in other words, pitched a tent among us. Now, no doubt, John, in saying this, choosing this special word, has in mind the Old Testament tabernacle. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle that Moses and the children of Israel dragged through the wilderness and then brought into the promised land for a time was called the tent of meeting. It was called the tent of meeting because it was the place where God and man came together for the purpose of fellowship. Of course, tents, a tent is a temporary structure. And so the tabernacle was eventually replaced with a temple, a more permanent structure, although that was eventually torn down by the Romans. But uh, guys, listen, the tabernacle and later on the temple both pointed to Jesus Christ. In fact, if you want to Take a look at this in depth and get our study from Hebrews 9 or, I believe, Exodus 36, 35, 36. 
Because we took apart the tabernacle piece by piece and, point, and, and um, applied every piece to Jesus, how it all pointed to him. You see, the tabernacle was the tent of meeting. It was the place where God and man came together for the purpose of fellowship. Well, the uh, tabernacle and later the temple both pointed to Christ. He said, Jesus did, uh, said that in the volume of the book is written of me. But you see, it's only in Christ that we can have fellowship with God. When you got saved, the Bible says at that instant, you were placed by the Holy Spirit in Christ. What that means is now you have a dynamic union connection with Christ. You are in him. And only in Christ can a person have fellowship with God. They had fellowship with God in the Old Testament, but it was very limited. Not, not anything like the fellowship we have is being in Christ in the New Covenant. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But I just think that uh, John is uh, telling us, uh, you know, talking about uh, that when Jesus was incarnated upon the earth as a human being, his body was only a, a tent, a temporary dwelling place for his spirit. Yeah, it lasted about 33 years. That tent eventually died by crucifixion, of course, and was replaced with his glorified body, uh, when he rose from the dead, and uh, all when Jesus rose from the dead, he received a glorified body. That glorified body became a temple, a permanent dwelling place for his spirit uh, and his soul, which abide in his glorified body uh, forever. But guys, during the Old Testament period and under the Mosaic Covenant, God's people would go to the tabernacle to have their sins atoned for and their fellowship with God restored through the blood of the animals because sin separated them from God. So they would have to bring, as God prescribed, animal sacrifices, and the blood was shed to atone for their sins. In fact, the blood of the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't take away sin. They only temporarily covered sin. They were a kafar. We talk about Yom Kippur, day of covering. In the Jewish economy, the animal sacrifices never took away sin. Sin had not really been dealt with. God just allowed the animal sacrifices to be used for, for the blood to cover uh, temporarily the sins of his people that they might have some fellowship with him but of course we're going to see next week john the baptist introduces the lamb of god who didn't just cover but took away the sin of the world allowing us to have a relationship with god that in the old testament moses david uh, abraham Isaac, they never enjoyed uh, but we have the privilege of enjoying because we know christ but I just want you to understand something, that the tabernacle is a place where God and man came together for fellowship, wasn't full of grace. See, you know, the word became, you know, it says here of Jesus that he was full of grace, right? Uh, the tabernacle was not a place that was full of grace. It was a place of law. It was a place of law. And the central piece of furniture in the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, which sat in the Holy of Holies, Right? Now, we've talked about this, but if you're new, let me just quickly explain that the Ark of the Covenant was a small rectangular box measuring about 3 foot 9 inches long by 2 foot 3 inches wide, 2 foot 3 inches high. It was covered with gold inside and out and topped with a lid of pure gold called the mercy seat. On top of the mercy seat, there were two cherubim, angels, one at each end of the mercy seat kneeling, uh, facing each other with their heads bowed and their wings outstretched touching almost tip to tip directly above the mercy seat. That mercy seat was symbolically understood to be the throne of God on the earth. That's where God dwelt, in the Holy of Holies between the cherubim on the mercy seat and the tabernacle. But I want to be more specific about where I'm going with this. The Ark of the Covenant, though, is the central piece of furniture in the uh, tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant was also called the Ark of the Testimony. Why was it called that? Because it contained the law of God, written on two tablets of stone, also called the Tablets of the Testimony. What were these? The Ten Commandments. But they were the law of God. When John tells us that the Word, Jesus Christ, was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and that He was full of grace and truth, he has in mind, no doubt, I'm convinced he does, the difference between the Old Covenant under Moses 
and the new covenant under Christ. Something that he states clearly in verse 17 when he says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If you remember when we studied Exodus, the book of Exodus, and we were in chapter 19, as God was giving the law to Moses, who was up on Mount Sinai, and remember what God had told Moses. He said, make sure you tell the people that they are not to come near the mountain. They're not to come near. If an animal or a person happens to set foot on the base of the mountain, they are to be killed. They are to be killed. And of course, if you remember reading the scene, nobody wanted to come near the mountain. There was lightning and thunder and earthquakes and a trumpet blast that kept getting progressively louder. The people were terrified. See, this was the law. The law was saying, get away. The law was saying, you're not worthy to come to me. Uh, God is saying directly. In fact, they had a priesthood, right? Because in the Old Testament economy, the people weren't uh, allowed to come to God directly. They weren't worthy. They needed a go-between, right? The priest became the go-between. And the Old Covenant was not like the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, God was saying basically, you know, keep away. But under the New Covenant, He is saying, come near. Come near. Again, under the Old Covenant, um, well, it wasn't the law never really, um, again, atoned for sins and only covered the sins. So the law couldn't really take sin away. Uh, it was only a temporary fix, solution, uh, until the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, had come. But once Jesus came and died for our sins, the Bible says his blood washed them away completely for those of us who have received him. And so again, the opposite is now true. Whereas the Old Testament, the Old Covenant said, stay away, the New Covenant says, come near. I'll read you two scriptures on this. Hebrews 10, 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. There is a temple in heaven, of which the earthly temple and tabernacle was a kind of a replica of. But in heaven, there's a heavenly temple that contains a holy of holies. But there's not a box there overlaid with gold. There is God himself, where his real throne is, right? And the writer is saying, brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into the heavenly holy of holies because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are now worthy. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished, bowed his head, dismissed his spirit. At that moment, the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in half by God. And God was saying, open house. You don't need a priest anymore. You can come to me directly. Because of Jesus as the mediator who, you know, his sin made you worthy now because it's washed away your sins. His blood, I should say, made you worthy because he's, he's washed away your sins. You can have now bold access into my presence, Hebrews 4.16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Love it. But getting back to the incarnation. After John declares this incredible truth that the word, God, became a flesh and blood human being and lived among us, he goes on to say in verse 14, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen, the glory inherent in the Son was inherited from the Father as he, Jesus, was begotten of the Father through the incarnation. When John says, we beheld his glory, what does he mean, really? What does he mean? Well, commentators believe he could have two things in mind. And maybe both. First of all, we beheld his glory could be John's way of saying they beheld the glory of Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember how that uh, Peter, James, and John went with the Lord up to this high mount. I believe it was Mount Hermon. Um, and there it says at one point Jesus' face began to radiate like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And he was transfigured. The Greek word is metamorphized. Uh, the same word we get our word metamorphosis, like when a caterpillar, you might say, spins a cocoon and changes and comes out a butterfly. You see, the Bible says that 
Jesus, when he took on a human body, and this is very important, Philippians 2 does not say he laid aside his deity. God cannot stop being God. He laid aside his glory that was his in heaven. I mean, he was God. He worshiped his God. But he laid that all aside when he took on a human body and was born in a stable, the lowliest of surroundings, into a poor family. I mean, he worked hard. Uh, He got hungry. He got tired. He had to sleep. This was all a part of what it meant for him to be a man. Of course, he grew up and he was able to be killed. Jesus laid aside his glory that was his in heaven. And when he went up on top of that mount of transfiguration and he began to to change it was really what was going on it was a preview of his second coming glory that jesus his his deity was veiled in humanity but now the humanity being gone in the sense where his his previous body uh had been glorified now when jesus comes at this, the word glory, by the way, means to shine forth. When Jesus comes at his second coming, he said in Matthew 24, I'm going to light the sky up with my second coming glory. Every eye is going to see me like lightning, lightning flashes across a dark sky from east to west. Every eye is going to see me. But right now, when Jesus was on the earth at his first coming, again, the glory that was his as God was veiled in humanity. And so John could be talking about that. We beheld his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. But I think a lot of other commentators, and I happen to hold to this too, um, what John was talking about when he said we beheld his glory, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. I think that was a statement by John uh, speaking of the overall life and ministry of Jesus. The overall life and ministry. Uh, Don't you know Jesus lived a unique life? He was a unique man, but he also lived a unique life. I think this is the correct interpretation because John seems to qualify what he means by Jesus' glory when he says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. See, those are attributes of God. When we talk about Jesus uh, shining forth the glory of God, It's a way of saying he was presenting to this world uh, what God was like. Um, Again, the world had not seen God, really. We're going to talk about this more in a moment. But Jesus came not only to die for our sins, but to show the world what God was really like, to shine forth and to to declare God by showing the attributes, the character of God. And part of that was he was full of grace and truth. Jesus manifested God's grace during his earthly ministry in that he he, he extended his hand and invited people, the worst of sinners, harlots, tax collectors, other overt sinners, to come and be saved. See, these were the folks that the Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, had all written off as uh, fodder for hell. They were irre- irredeemable. They, they, they were a basket of deplorables. Irredeemable, you know? There was no hope for them. They were just going to fuel the fires of hell. That's all they were good for, the rabbis and Pharisees taught. But not Jesus. Jesus didn't look at him like that. God's grace is all about extending a gift of eternal life, right? It's not about how worthy you are. None of us are worthy of eternal life. But Jesus came and he offered God's grace to the worst in society by inviting them to come to be saved, to be, become children of God. That was an incredible act of grace. But also, John says he was not just full of grace, but full of truth. And he constantly revealed God's truth to the people of his area, wherever he was, through his teachings. Turn to John 8. In John 8, verse 31, we read, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word... You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth that he had come to give, the truth he had been preaching for thirty, for uh, three and a half years before his crucifixion. Um, remember we said, as we started John's gospel, how John began to say that Jesus 
you know, he, he was uh, life, and the life was the light of men. We talked about light, okay? He was, in him was life. Well, that was the life of God, of course. And the light, life was the light of men. What does that mean? We talked about this. That was God's truth being declared. The truth of God that would bring men and women to this life. The gospel, basically, okay? But the idea is Jesus came to give this world light, truth. He came into a world of darkness, a world controlled by the devil. A world full of lies, deception, and so on. The devil is a liar. Jesus is going to say in John 8, he was a liar from the beginning. He only knows how to lie. But Jesus came into the world as God's truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The idea is that he came to give truth to a world of lies that people might see the light, be drawn to it, and be saved. And John says in verse 15, that John, John the Apostle, is, is Apostle of St. John the Baptist, bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, we know from Luke's Gospel that John the Baptist was roughly six months older than Jesus and that he started his public ministry about six months uh, before Jesus did. And during that time... John kept bearing witness that Messiah was coming and that he was going to be unique, that he was going to be the Son of God. When John says, he who, he who comes after me is preferred before me because he was before me, you have to understand, John is saying, this one that is coming, even though I'm older than him physically, he's greater than me. In the Jewish mind, the elder was always greater than the younger. The patriarch of the family, the father, he was the greatest of all in the family because he was the oldest male, right? And what John is saying is, John the Baptist says, look, I'm older than him physically, but he is preferred before me because he was before me. You see, he's the son of God who had no beginning, right? We've talked about this. In the beginning was the word. The Greek word he uses means timeless existence. In, the, in eternity past, as far back as you want to go, Jesus Christ has already existed. He's God. He never had a beginning. So even though he's younger than me physically, he's greater than me in so many ways because I had a beginning. He did not. He was preferred before me. Verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. What does that mean? First of all, and of his fullness we have all received. I think that John is talking about the spiritual life that is in Christ. Again, that's his theme. He wants people to, to, to come to Christ to receive the life that is, in, is uh, inherent in Jesus, but that he will give to all those who believe in him. But if you're teaching this, and we have 2,000 years of church history, okay? But think of the folks John was declaring these truths to that were hearing them for the first time. Come to Jesus and receive this life. Oh, but is it going to run out if too many people come? The idea, you know, right. I mean, boy, he's got a lot of followers. Is there enough left for me? John is saying, look, this life, there's a fullness here, which the idea is it is, um, it is infinite. There's, there's plenty of life in Christ to go around. Jesus said, look, all who come to me, I won't turn any away. It's not that like Jesus has only got a certain amount of life that he can give, and when he runs out, too bad. Sorry, the sale's over. You should have come earlier, kind of a thing. No, he is what? Sufficient. That becomes a theme in Paul's writings, the sufficiency of Christ. And um, it's not only that Jesus is sufficient to save all who come to him, but once we come to him, he is sufficient to give us everything we need for life and godliness because it flows from him. We are connected to him and therefore he is an inexhaustible source of life and strength and power, whatever we need. And I think this dovetails with what he goes on to say and um, the expression John uses that uh, of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. I think what John is saying is uh, he's talking really about grace upon grace or abundant grace. Abundant grace. Grace basically means a gift. A gift we don't deserve, a gift we can't earn. It's just a gift God gives us. 
The greatest is salvation. That's a gift, free gift of God. But after we get saved, uh, Paul said uh, we are saved by grace. I think Romans 5, 2, we stand in an environment of grace. And anything we need, anything we need, we just read it. God says, you can come boldly to my throne to receive grace and, and help in time of need. Grace, think of it as a gift of whatever you need. You need whatever power you need to overcome uh, bad habits or certain other things. Whatever you need to be all that God wants you to be, you, you don't work harder to try to, to make it. You come to Christ to receive it. It's, it's there. Whatever you need, that's what, it's grace. You know, and, and, and you know what? As Paul said in the book of Romans, there's always enough grace to be saved. Where sin abounded, Paul said, grace superabounded. There is no person whose life is so sinful that God's grace can't save them if they come to him. I was reading yesterday about the life of John Newton, and I forgot the details, but boy, was he a nasty character. Okay, I mean, he was a bad guy. And he trafficked in, you know, slaves and was just miserable and, and uh, just, uh, just uh, talk about an overt sinner. Okay, John seemed to glorify in sin. And, um, and almost died at least on one occasion. In fact, he, he was on a ship and it was a storm and he got thrown overboard and uh, ready to drown. And one of the sailors harpoons him and pulls him back. He had a scar uh, the rest of his life. Okay. But God literally pulled him out of death. And eventually John gets saved and becomes one of the greatest preachers the church has ever known. Writing one of the famous hymns we've ever known. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Look. Sometimes God saves the worst of us to, to, to prove to the rest of us nobody is so bad that God can't forgive them. There's abundant grace, okay? There is grace upon grace, and so on. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law, the old covenant, couldn't save. It could only show us how sinful we were. And again, the law was 613 commandments. Just think of the 10, the ones we're most familiar with, all right? There's a lot of folks who think if they just work hard to keep those 10 commandments, they can earn heaven. You don't have to read your Bible very far in the New Testament to, to see that it's absolutely false. So anyone who believes that is not reading the Bible, the New Testament at all, because it said in many places, Romans 3.20 uh, for by the deeds of the law are no is no flesh justified, for by the law comes the knowledge of what? Sin. As somebody has said, the law is like looking in a mirror. I can look into a mirror, and a mirror can show me my face is dirty. It can't clean my face. It can't clean the dirt off. The law, if I look into the law, I can see that I'm a sinner. I violated every one of those many times over. But all it can do is show me I'm a sinner. It can't do anything to take away that sin. That's where grace comes in. That's where the new covenant under Christ comes in. He is the mediator, the Bible says, of a new and better covenant. A covenant whereby we receive salvation as a gift by simply putting our faith in Christ once we receive him as Lord and Savior. But guys, not only did Jesus offer us grace to be saved, he continues, as we just said earlier, to offer us the grace we need in any situation to live for God and be everything God desires us to be. Even as James said in chapter 4, verse 6, he said, He, God, gives us more grace. Well, what do you mean? Well, as much, as, as much grace as God has given you in your life up to this point, he'll give you more if you need it. You know, will it ever run out? No. It's inexhaustible. I mean, God is infinite, so everything he has is infinite. And God is a God of grace. And so everything we need, and, uh, and this idea that I can sin my way out of salvation, and there, because if I sin enough, I can, I, the grace of God runs out. That, that, I don't know where people get that. It's not in the Bible. Don't try it. It's just not in the Bible. There's a lot of people that teach that. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can fall out of Christ, lose your salvation. Like the little girl whose mommy tucked her into bed one night. And then her mom goes back into her bed and all of a sudden hears a thud. 
runs back into her daughter's room and finds a little girl on the floor. And mommy says, her mom says, honey, what happened? And the little girl says, mommy, I think I stayed too close to the place I got in. Don't stay too close to the place you got in. When you get saved, the goal is not to see how far, not to see how close you can stay to the old life and kind of stick a toe over the, you know, the border, the borderline one. So just to kind of live in both worlds. No, the goal of the Christian life is to keep drawing close to Jesus. Okay, keep drawing close to Jesus. But um, there's always grace, though. God is always will extend grace if we repent of our sins. There's always forgiveness and so on. Now, but John also says that not only is Jesus full of grace, he was full of truth. And um, in verse 17, when he says, you know, uh, he was full of truth, he has in mind the truth of God once again. Uh, the truth of God that Jesus came to deliver during his earthly ministry. We read about this in John's Gospel. Turn to chapter 12. Again, talking about Jesus being... The light of God coming into a world of darkness and giving people the light of truth. is yeah, but, but he was challenged by the Pharisees and scribes uh, of speaking of his, out of his own heart, out of his own, you know. He was just giving them words that you know, he came up with. And he made, on several occasions, he made sure they understood. John 12, verse 49 said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. I'm not giving you my words. And John will repeat this because Jesus said it numerous times throughout the gospel, John records, um, to the Pharisees who were constantly telling him, We've never heard this before. You're just coming up with this on your own. No. The Father sent me. And he told me what to say. I'm just telling you what he said. Okay? John 14, verse 24. Jesus said, He who does not love me does not keep my word. So a person who claims to be a Christian but does not at all, at all, follow the teachings of Christ, Jesus said, Well, you don't really love me. You're not my disciple." He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. All right? Back to John chapter 1, verse 18. John says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No one has seen God at any time. This troubles people because... In the Old Testament, you know, it seems like some people did see God and so on. No. Nobody at any time has ever seen God in all of his fullness and glory. Moses wanted to. He said, Lord, show me your, you know, let me see your face. And God says, Moses, if I showed you my full glory, if I showed you my face, unfiltered, <laughs> with any kind of a, if I showed you my fullness, you would be incinerated. Here's what I'll do, though. Go hide in the cleft of the rock there. I'll put my hand over you. I'll walk by and I'll take my hand away. You can see my afterglow. Best I can do, son. Best I can do for you. But that's the idea. Nobody can look at the face of God in all of his fullness and live. Again, Exodus 33, 20. Besides that, God's invisible, right? And therefore cannot be seen with the human physical eye. And yet Paul the Apostle said of Jesus in Colossians 1.15 that, listen, he is the image of the invisible God. The word he uses is a Greek word that was used of an image made by an impression as when Caesar's image was stamped on a coin. And so Paul is telling us that God the Father stamped, if you will, his image on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ which means that Jesus was the exact manifestation of God, the exact manifestation of God in human form. This allowed man to see what God was like. Again, God is spirit and is therefore invisible, but through the incarnation, the invisible God became a visible flesh and blood man. As we said before, this was important, and one of the reasons Jesus came to the earth, two main reasons, yes, to die for our sins, absolutely. But the other reason was to show people what God was really like. What God was really like. Uh, the Jews had lived in sin for so long, false you know, idolatry and all that stuff. 
they, they constantly saw God's wrath and judgment. They did see his mercy and grace in the Old Testament, but it was limited, especially as the nation progressed, okay? And um, before the um, Assyrians came and 100 years later the Babylonians came, they had gotten pretty bad. And because of it, they only really saw God's judgment, God's, you know, wrath poured out. And this caused many to believe that's who God was, a vengeful, wrathful God. You couldn't get close to a God like that. You're terrified. You run. You hide. And Jesus came to show people, look, that's not who God is. I mean, God is a loving God. Yes, he's a righteous and holy God. And if you will continue to walk in sin, he'll have to judge you. But that's not his first choice. God is merciful. He wants to show mercy. He wants to show how much he loves people. And, um, and so Jesus Christ became the visible image of God Almighty. And he, as he said to Philip in the upper room the night before the cross, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I love this uh, statement that Jesus, who was in the bosom of the Father, that's a statement of intimacy. You know, long before God created everything, including us, there was just the Trinity. In eternity past, there was just the Godhead, the Trinity. And they had this incredible relationship with each other of total love, intimacy, oneness. And Jesus enjoyed this intimacy with his Father before the world was created. In fact, he said in John 17, right before the cross, he said, Father, I have manifested your name to the people of this world. I have shown forth your glory in the sense I have totally um, represented you to the people, so that people know who you really are now. And now will you glorify me with the glory we had before the world began? See, he wants to go back to that time when him, him and his father were in this incredible union with each other. Now, here's something you may not have thought about, okay, and bring this to a close. When it says that Jesus before the incarnation, was in the bosom of the Father. Again, speaking of deep intimacy. Do you know one of the reasons Jesus came down from, the earth, from heaven? Yes, to die for our sins, to show us what God was like. But do you realize that God only saved us as a byproduct to what he really wanted to get through the whole thing? You know, yeah, you have to save somebody to have fellowship with them. You have to save them before they can become one with you. You have to save them before they can be cradled in your bosom, right? This is what God desired. The very same relationship that Jesus had with the Father in eternity past, He has come down to the earth, lived and died, rose again, that we might have that same intimate relationship with Him. That we might be in His bosom in a sense, right? Close to Him, close to His heart. I love John, the apostle. Remember in the upper room? As they were up, uh, reclining around the table, they didn't sit, they, they laid on one our, uh, side reclining. Well, Jesus was in the middle of John, who was in front of him, and Judas, who was behind him. And what does it say of John? He was doing what? He was what? He was reclining or leaning on Jesus' bosom. John's, I'm getting a head start here, okay? I'm gonna, John just loved to be, uh, you know, close to the Lord. He loved to be, you know, and, and, and he said... He called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Does that mean that Jesus didn't love anyone else? Of course not. But John was saying, he loves me. You know, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> but, you know, we buy into the devil's lies, even as Christians, who is always pointing out our weaknesses, our faults, our flaws. So consequently, when the devil whispers in our ears enough that we're failures, we're not measuring up. God doesn't really love us because we keep blowing it. It's hard to, we don't really feel close to God. We don't feel like going over and giving him a big hug. Uh, but we have to understand, Jesus took care of all of that. In Christ, we're perfect. And it's not that God just, you know, we knock on the door of his office. It's not that he says, oh, okay, well, come on, I'll give you a couple minutes. He drops everything to just, he wants, yesterday, I'm in my office working on the message, right? And I'm laboring and I'm sweating and I'm praying, Lord, I don't want to ramble. Please let it all come together in some coherent. Now you tell me if I accomplish that. Some coherent message where it's flowing and people can understand it. All of a sudden the door opens up. Here's my little granddaughter. Don't you know? Everything stops. I, I scooped her up in my arms, you know, give her one of those hugs, you know. When she gets tired, she just wants to hug tight. This is our God. 
I mean, you think he's busy running the universe? He's not too busy for you to come into his presence. Jump up on the, his lap on his throne and give him a big hug. In fact, he says, you know what? You're my children now. Call me Abba, Daddy, Papa. This is how he wants to relate to us. Of course, the devil wants to keep us away from God. But God saying, come near. Under the new covenant, you come close. Okay? I want you to, I want you to be in my bosom in a sense. I want to have that intimacy with you. All right, guys. Interesting word here declared. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son was in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. That's a Greek word. We got our word exegesis from. Exegesis. Exegesis, from a homiletical standpoint, is extracting from the passage everything God has said. So when I study a passage, what I do is I break it down. Uh, piece by piece, word by word, sometimes letter by letter, tenses and everything else, right? And I look at everything individually and then I reconstruct it because now hopefully I have now understood the passage where I now can exegete from it what God has said. Eisegesis, a lot of that going on, is reading into the passage what you want it to say. Exegesis is extracting from the passage what God has actually said. Jesus came to declare he exegeted God for us he explained he didn't read into God what you know he he extracted from the character of God all that God is and gave it to us that we could understand God in a way we could never have understood God without Jesus coming in fact one author said that he said we simply cannot understand God apart from knowing Jesus Christ we can't he is the only begotten son that, that word in the Greek, only begotten, only begotten, is a word that means unique, the one and the only one of its kind. Unique, the only one of its kind. Listen, God has many adopted sons and girls. In the kingdom, you're going to be sons too. What do you mean? In the Jewish culture, the sons were always greater than the daughters. It's just the way it was. Not only in Greek culture, Greek, uh, Jewish culture, but Greek culture, Roman culture, uh, the women typically were not on the same level as the men. It was wrong. It's how, they, it's how it was. And so Jesus and the other New Testament writers talked about the sons of God, including men and women in the kingdom. It was, it was their way of saying in the kingdom there are no second-class citizens. Girls, you're not daughters anymore in the sense that you're second-class to the guys. You're all sons of God. You're all equal. God loves all of you the same, right? But when it says that, so I said God had as many adopted sons, but only one, listen, divinely conceived, virgin-born son, the unique, the one and only son of God, Jesus Christ. And he's not just the son of God, yes, he's also God the son. John's already tackled that. He is the second person. I say, and that's important because there are groups that say, well, Jesus was the Son of God, but lesser than the Father. Job's witnesses say this, that, you know, um, he was the, the first begotten Son of God in the sense he was created. He's a mighty God, but lesser than Almighty Jehovah God. Absolutely wrong, false. We've talked about this in John's introduction. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But he's also God the Son, second person of the Trinity. Even the demons acknowledged this before anyone else figured it out. And Jesus was a shut up. It's a loose translation. <laughs> Be quiet. You know, he wanted people to know this by revelation. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not declare this to you, but my Father has revealed this to you. This is what Jesus wanted. For people have open hearts where God would reveal this truth to them. All right, we're done. This concludes John's mini crash course in Christology. As he, as he has introduced us to the true Christ. The uh, only one who can impart spiritual or eternal life. Because he's the only one who has this life. In him was life, Zoe, eternal, spiritual, the life of God. Only Jesus has it. No false Christ or Messiah could ever man manufacture that life. It's, it's the life of God, and only God can impart it, Jesus being God the Son. If you have this life, or you have Christ, you have this life. Let me just turn, have you turn to one more scripture we'll close. 1 John 5.
1 John 5, starting with verse 11. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Life And guys, that now becomes the main idea as we, as we progress now into John's narrative, his gospel, that uh, the only way to have life is by having the Son. And we'll look at that starting next week in more detail. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. It's a light that lights our way in the darkness of this world. Of course, Jesus is the light uh, in human form who came down from heaven and became one of us, um, the only one that has the life of God residing in him, who then became the light of the world to teach the world what you were like, to present your truth, the gospel, that anyone who would receive you, Lord Jesus, would have this eternal life. So, Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless these studies. We're living in a world of great deception, darkness, and lies. Many false Christs have come even in our day, many groups claiming to have the true Christ but don't. Lord, thank you that you have identified the true Christ uh, in a way that is just clear, yet concise. And we ask, Lord, you would continue to build on that truth now as we study John's gospel, uh, moving into the narrative starting next week, uh, God willing. Father, we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.